Yeah, I really appreciate everyone showing up. And really the purpose of this is just to share some stories from our track and training insights. And, you know, for those of you that are planning on going to Everspace Camp or are considering going there someday, hopefully this helps shed some light on what it's like to be out there and what you could expect on your track. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mikey Bell. I'm an owner and trainer at Outdoor Adventure Training. And I'm also a mountain guide with Shasta Mountain Guides. And outside of all that, I love being outside, love being in the mountains, hiking, climbing, skiing, anything like that. And really that's what outdoor adventure training is all about. Uh, it looks like we got quite a few outdoor adventure training athletes in the chat today, which is awesome. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for sharing the invite. And yeah, I'll pass it over to my dad, Dennis, let him introduce him, himself. He, we were on the trek together and um, yeah, he'll be a part of this discussion as well. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm Dennis, Mikey's dad, as he just said, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming here. I live in the, the Bay Area, Mola Creek, about five hours from Mikey, lives in Ashland right now, and I grew up here, stayed in the Bay Area, uh, turned 66 in August, and Mikey invited me on this trek, and we'll learn more about it. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Right on. Uh, just a couple things real quick. Just keep your, your microphone muted for now. Um, if you do have a question, we'll have some Q&A time at the end. Uh, just write it down if you need to remember it. Um, but yeah, let's just hold questions for the end. There's quite a bit to work through here, and we're going to try to wrap this up in the hour. So generally how this is going to work, order of operations, we'll kind of talk about our plan and how the trip came into fruition and just kind of our process of, of how to plan for a trip like this, uh, how that informed our training of what we did ahead of the trek to get ready. That was a huge component of all of this. Um, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes here, the, the trek and the climb and kind of all the details, a good day by day on how that was. And then we will certainly have time for question and answer at the end. So <clears throat> diving right into it here. Uh, yeah, back in March, I, I pitched this idea to my dad. I, like I mentioned, I'm a mountain guide, love being outside, a lot of time in the Pacific Northwest mountaineering, have done Kilimanjaro in Africa, 19,000 feet, and really wanted to take that next step and do something big. And I knew that if I went out there, I'd be taking a bunch of pictures and sending them to my dad. And I was like, well, this would be a pretty cool thing for us to do together. So I pitched it to him and uh, there was a little bit of resistance at first, but eventually he came around and was like, okay, let's do this. So we booked our trip and, and got to training. Uh, we kind of chose the dates from late September to mid October, uh, kind of this nice window post monsoon season, kind of right at the beginning of the peak trekking season in the fall. So our goal was to get good weather, but also miss the crowds, which we sat, we kind of did, <laughs> um, but we definitely had some days of poor weather, uh, but also some days of no people around, which was amazing. Um, also, just a special shout out to my mentor and good friend, Eric Soul. Uh, he spent a lot of time in the Himalayas, and he really helped me kind of fine tune this plan um, and gave us some recommendations for guides. He has a lot of connections out there, uh, which is ultimately how we got in touch with Chani from Trekmandu amazing guide, amazing company. Uh, they're the best and I would highly recommend them. I can share contact info uh, for those guys. And yeah, from start to finish working with Chani um, and our assistant guide Sonam who we met in Lukla. Um, yeah, it was, it was an incredible experience and, and we'll talk more about that throughout the presentation. So still in this planning phase, we were kind of looking at what we wanted to do. You know, there's uh, so many places to go in the Himalayas and you know it seemed like well if we're going to go there we should go big um and ever space camp is definitely going big that's like the epicenter of of why you're going to nepal the tallest mountain in the world so this was our our trip plan our itinerary this this is retroactively from gaia and on that note gaia is a really powerful gps tool that i know all of my clients are familiar with at this point but if you've never used Gaia and you're spending a lot of time outside, I would highly recommend using it. Um, I use it for all of my adventures, whether it's a day trip or multi-day international expedition, it's amazing. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we kind of worked our way up to Namche, around up to Gokio, over Chola Pass, up to EBC, over to Island Peak and out. So this is a long itinerary. 
Um, this ended up being 20 days. We wanted that time. This is the trip of a lifetime for my dad and I, and we, we wanted to extend that. There are definitely ways to get to Everspace Camp in less time, but we wanted to maximize our time out there and make the most of this experience. So as far <laughs> as gear and planning, uh, planning for being gone out of the country for a month is it's a lot, especially traveling from, you know, 7,000 feet up to 20,000 feet, having stuff when you're in the city and stuff when you're on top of a mountain, it's a lot to bring and kind of a double-edged sword of having six months to prepare is you got a lot of time to get what you need and a lot of time to be indecisive too. Uh, so a lot of last minute gear shifts for sure. And um, you know, special shout out to to Ultralight Sacks who sponsored this trip, um, providing a custom backpack and a duffel bag. Really awesome, sustainable, durable gear. Highly recommend checking them out. We have a link on our website to them. Um, they make really awesome stuff. So this might not look like that much, uh, but when you break it down into words, it was quite a lot of stuff to bring. Now, if I were to go back, honestly, there are a few things here that I would probably leave behind, but for the most part, used just about all of it. Um, again, highlighting this 35 liter backpack, kind of had a running vest style. So I had my phone tucked on my shoulder the whole time. Uh, I also had it designed for mountaineering. So I had an ice axe carry, helmet carry, um, really awesome pack. Two other big things to highlight out of everything, the Steri pen. Um, so out there, you know, here on <laughs> in, in America, we have weak stomachs and can't handle the water and the bacteria and stuff that's out there. And you don't want to get sick and run that risk. So Steri pen uses UV light to not kill anything in the water, but denature the proteins and scramble that so it doesn't actually get you sick. So rather than going through plastic water bottles every day, we brought, we each brought our Nalgene reusable plastic bottle, filled up the water and sterilized our water. And I did a little calculation and we collectively probably reduced our waste by 180 to over 200 plastic water bottles just by using our SteriPen. Um, they're USB rechargeable and they're fantastic. I've had mine for six plus years. I've brought it on three international trips, and it's really my main main go to uh, purification sterilization process whenever I'm in the backcountry. Um, additionally, the Garmin Inreach. If you're spending time outside on adventures, you should have a Garmin Inreach. Um, for those of you that know me or you know were training with me at the time, you were probably checking our trip tracker on the website. That was all powered by our Garmin Inreach. It's a GPS satellite device that allows you to text whether you have service or not wherever you are in the world really really incredible tool um, and yeah just a safety measure too if you're out there outside of just logistics and coordinating and all the fun stuff um, it could really help you if you get into a sticky situation but just kind of putting into perspective it's a lot of stuff to bring um, especially with a mountaineering plan so hey, Mike, on the yeah story plan we, Mike and I each had a steri pen and I broke mine probably about, I don't know, about a third of the way through the trip. So luckily Mikey had one. You can't rely on the steri pen 100% because the, the tip is glass. So make sure our guide told us before we even left, bring some backup water purification tablets or drops. So we brought that too. But since we each had a steri pen, we were able to use Mikey's for the trip. Yeah, really good point. Um, it's definitely not foolproof. And to have a backup, like with anything, is really important. Uh, so moving on to, to our guides. As I mentioned, Chani here is our lead guide. That's from the summit of Island Peak. Super skilled, has been guiding in the Himalayas for 12 plus years. Um, awesome interpersonal skills. Bedside manner was amazing when I and my dad got super sick. Um, he was there by, with us 100% of the way and, and was amazing to work with. Um, he's also from a village in, in rural Nepal. Sonam here, our assistant guide, it was his first trip guiding, and you would have never known it. Uh, he is so friendly, and he's born and raised in Lukla, which is a village at 9,000 feet. And I asked him, how many times have you been to Everest Base Camp? He's like, I don't know. I was like, well, just give me a number. And he said 500, at least 500 times. He grew up literally you know, 30 or 40 miles away, and he lives there. Um, so he was right at home. He knew so many people along the trail. He was really fun to be around. Um, and we did make the decision to hire a porter, made it more accessible for us, especially with the Island Peak climb, the length of the climb just kind of decreases the stress on us. 
and it creates work for local people. And our guides actually encouraged us to hire porters um, because it helps the local economy and it helps us. Um, and our porter was also named Sonam. So we called him Sonam too. Our packs would be ready to go uh, before we left the tea house and we'd start hiking, get to the ne next tea house and our bags are waiting for us in our beds, uh, which was really a luxury, honestly. Um, <clears throat> that being said, you could totally do this trek without a porter, but for the reasons I mentioned, that's why we opted to have a porter. We also had a second porter that was specifically for our climbing gear. When we landed and ended up being Cirque, he carried our gear to the final tea house before the Island Peak climb where we collected our gear and then kind of reversed that on the way back. So uh, kind of phasing into training here, this was kind of the big, you know, leading up to the trip is outside of planning logistics. This is the other big thing. You can plan all the logistics in the world, but if your body's not prepared when you show up, it's gonna be more difficult. So this is just kind of highlighting some general training benefits and not just for an Everest base camp trek, but really any outdoor pursuit you're gonna undergo. Um, these are some of the big takeaways of, of why you should train for something like this. So first of all, and arguably most importantly, it's reducing your risk of not just acute injury, like twisting your ankle, uh, but the chronic injury. You know, we were walking for 20 consecutive days. And if your body's not used to that, it puts a lot of strain on the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, and your body needs to be prepared to handle that load. Additionally, and I said that was most important, but I think these do get more important as you go down the list here. It makes your trek and your trip more enjoyable. Because we were well-trained, we could be hiking along this steep trail at 15,000 feet and enjoy our view. You know, it doesn't mean we weren't breathing hard at high altitude, but um, <clears throat> you, it just made it more enjoyable and makes your whole experience more worthwhile that you can really just soak in what you're experiencing. And lastly, outside of your adventure, it will improve your overall quality of life. Uh, there's so much research on there and the benefits of aerobic training and strength training. And I'm not going to get into all of that. That's like a whole nother hour long presentation, but um, there's more benefit than just getting ready for a trip. Um, which, you know, I told my dad when we started training or we started getting ready for this trip, I was like, well, you know, everyone says international travel, especially going to Nepal, it's going to change your life. And this was like a couple months into training. And he's like, well, you know, how's it really going to change my life? And I was like, well, it already has. Look how much you've, the work you've put in and how much you've been training and studying this new material and learning new things, um, especially later in life, you know, just setting a small objective or, or a big objective like this one um, can just fuel your motivation and get you excited for life. This training timeline on the right here is just a general rule of thumb, depending, you know, if you're going to be training for a big objective, like a huge trek, or you want to climb a big mountain, this is just a general rule of thumb. If you're relatively fit and have been training regularly for the last maybe three to five years, you could probably be totally physically prepared with no issues in three to six months. If you're kind of somewhat active, but have been in and out of like a, a structured training program for a while, you know, it might take six to 12 months. And really, if, if you have just been, you know, <laughs> sitting on the couch for a few years, it could take a few years to build that strong aerobic base and that muscular endurance that's really required for something like this. And luckily, you know, obviously I'm a trainer, a mountain guide. I've been training for a while. And luckily my dad has been regularly going to the gym for more or less his entire adult life and had a really solid foundation to build from. Okay, so getting into like our specific approach to training for this trip, we knew what variables to expect. We knew we were going to have long days on our feet. We knew there was going to be a lot of mileage, a lot of elevation gain and loss. I highlighted the loss because a lot of people underestimate how difficult it is to go down. And, you know, that stands true, not just for trekking, but more so in mountaineering. I'm sure some of you here have heard the saying, going up is optional, coming down is mandatory. Um, that maybe leads more into decision making, but you got to be prepared to go downhill. We knew we were going to be not just having long days, but having 20 of them in a row, which is a lot. And most people's schedule and lifestyle, it's, it's hard to program that time to train 20 days in a row. We also knew we were going to be carrying a backpack every day, somewhere between 12 and 20 pounds, depending on the hike, where we were on the trek. 
And another huge variable that is mostly out of our control, traveling at high altitude. That's something that's very difficult to train for, particularly where we live on the West Coast, or if you're zooming in from somewhere else here, um, pretty much unless you live in the Himalayas or in the Andes, it's tough to have access to that sort of altitude. So these were the variables we knew that we were gonna be faced, and these were the adaptations we wanted to prepare for these variables. So first, improving our cardiovascular endurance. That's huge. Uh, that's the ability to crush these long days day in and day out. Improving our VO2 max. Uh, there's a lot of research out there now showing that that can improve your ability to uptake oxygen when you're working at altitude. Not that it's going to help you acclimatize per se, but once you are acclimatized, you will perform better uh, at lower energy expenditures. Improving muscular endurance, that was a no-brainer. Your legs need the strength to get that much vert. Uh, we clocked close to 40,000 feet of elevation gain in those 20 days. We needed that leg strength, core strength, and back strength for balance, stability, carrying a backpack every day. It all comes into play when you're trekking and climbing. Um, another big one here was increasing muscle mass. So anticipated we were going to lose some weight out there. Um, one of my goals in particular was to put on some muscle mass. I run on the leaner side. I didn't want to come back super frail and not be able to get back into training and get ready for ski season because there is life out of this expedition is the reality. And having that extra muscle mass, I thought would be beneficial. Improving mobility. If you're training with me, you know I'm big on mobility, uh, foam rolling, static stretching, dynamic stretching, all of those things come into, again, that injury prevention that I mentioned earlier. The sport-specific adaptation is a big one. We're walking a lot. You know, had we trained biking all summer, we certainly would not have been as prepared. So whatever objective it is you're setting, having that sport-specific training is key. And last and arguably most importantly, all of these things, if we can acquire all of these adaptations, we're ultimately going to enhance our ability to dig deep and develop that grit we need. It got tough out there. I got super sick. <laughs> My dad got altitude sickness, but we knew like, okay, this hike, we can do a seven mile hike with 3000 feet of elevation game. We got this. We've done that a bunch at home, but there's a lot of other variables. You're eating weird food. You're sleeping in uncomfortable beds. Maybe you're not sleeping super well, you're dehydrated, and you're like in a foreign country, there's all these new things. There's so much going on out of your control. And if you can get your mind solid, it goes a long way for just feeling good when you're out there. Anything you want to add, Dad, real quick about, you know, just our training approach and kind of what to expect? Well, for me, I knew that the uh, training and getting myself in shape and physically ready to do the trek was in my control. I also knew that altitude was out of my control. So that was a variable I could not plan for or train for. But I did a lot of hiking. I hiked, I think, 50 hikes in preparation. When Mikey proposed the idea in March, when we decided to go in April, my first hike was April 30th. And my last hike was uh, probably about a week before, or maybe not even that long, a week before we left for Nepal in September. But I knew that if I did that, I could eliminate one variable that I had complete control over, and it did work. I did, I hiked three times a week and usually did my cardio with my uh, studio bike every, uh, three times a week. And then I did weights, including a lot of step ups and a lot of legs to get the legs strong. And then Sundays, I ride my bike usually to a brewery and have a beer. But I take ride my bike on a Sunday to get out, just kind of mix it up. I never trained for any anything like for a goal like this. So it was very different for me to do that, to train with the uh, end in mind. And it really helped me get through it because I hiked all, all my hikes. I think I did four with other people and the, all the rest of the 45 I did alone. And that was a grind. It got very grindy, especially I did a lot of hike, hiking in Mount Diablo, which is in my backyard, but there was rattlesnakes everywhere. So it kind of limited where I wanted to go because they, they scare me. <laughs> <laughs> I just, they scare me, but we did, uh, I did a lot of hiking and it paid off for the trip. The long days we did, I was tired, but not like physically exhausted. So it does pay off. It was fun to train for a goal. Definitely. Yeah. Shanks, thanks for sharing that. Having a goal is huge, you know, not just with training, but anything in life. When you have a goal and you put your mind to something, 
kind of gives you that, that stepping stone that you're reaching for every day. So moving along here, kind of getting more into the nitty gritty of, of my personal approach to training. Um, we kind of talked about those desired adaptations. These were the objectives that I had on my calendar basically for the entire summer to get ready for this trip. So um, luckily I'm a mountain guide, backpacking guide. I had 30 plus days of programmed training, essentially carrying a 40 to 60 pound pack and walking, which really was the perfect recipe to train for something like this. Um, and some of that is on Mount Shasta at high altitude. Additionally, I did a lot of trail running. Now I will say this, I love trail running. It gets me fired up and I really enjoy doing it. Um, that being said, Obviously, like my dad just said, he didn't do any trail running. He did a lot of hiking and was still successful. So if trail running is not your thing, don't think that you need to start running to, to get ready for something like this. It's certainly an effective tool, but not necessary. Um, with my running, I was trying to get as much elevation gain as possible. And there were a lot of times in the summer when I was shuffling up a hill and it was getting hard. And I was like, Island Peak's going to be harder than this. You should push it a little harder. And that was kind of that goal, you know, that I was aiming for constantly of like, okay, I'm going to keep grinding. Um, and that was also, of course, aerobic training, which real quick, aerobic is fueled by oxygen. So lower heart rate intensity and anaerobic is without oxygen, which, you know, working at altitude, there's not much oxygen up there. So that's where the anaerobic component came in. Additionally, I really wanted to put on muscle mass, hypertrophy because I was anticipating losing a lot. So I spent a lot of time weight training, um, a lot, you know, relatively a lot more than I usually do about three to four days a week. I was trying to increase my load, carrying more weight. Um, and then of course, <laughs> a lot of mobility training with all of, you know, increasing my trail running load, increasing my weight training, mobility goes hand in hand in that. If you, without that, you're kind of setting yourself up for some sort of injury that but ultimately hold you back on this kind of trek. So training by the numbers, um, these are kind of my, my stats from training. Now, I will say this too, this, didn't, this wasn't from Mar May 1st to the start of our trek. This was my whole year leading up to the trek. Um, so a lot of hours of running, a lot of hours of hiking, um, a lot of total elevation gain. And this was definitely... I think my, I'd have to look, but it might be my biggest training year of my life, really. Um, and this objective really helped me stay motivated in achieving that. So that was my program. My dad's program was a little bit different, but with the same desired adaptation. So like he mentioned, a lot of hiking. Um, he lives in a great place for training hikes, like right in the backyard of Mount Diablo. There's really steep hills. A lot of it was in some pretty uncomfortable heat. Um, which I think plays back into that grit, you know, of like, it's tough, but we're going to get through this. Um, and he started off small with those shorter four to six mile hikes, a little bit of elevation gain. And throughout the summer, slowly ramped it up to the point where, where you know, we hiked Mount McLaughlin, which is like 10 miles and 4,000 feet of elevation gain with a backpack, which is a huge achievement. And, you know, with that too, I remember throughout the summer, he'd be like, oh, I walked nine miles today and it was pretty easy which is, you know, sweet. We want to show up to Nepal feeling like nine miles is pretty easy at low elevation because as my dad mentioned, <laughs> the elevation is the one thing that's way out of our control. Um, in addition, like he mentioned, the weight training made a big difference in just that durability and injury prevention, especially as we age, we start to lose muscle mass and strength training, resistance training is really can what help counter that. Uh, he got a lot of his anaerobic training, not just from hiking, but those high intensity interval sessions on the Nordic track spin bike. And he was doing quite a bit of stretching too. Anything you want to add to this, dad? Cool. Sweet. Moving along here. So these were kind of his stats, um, which I got to say, dad, you crushed it. I'm super proud of you. Uh, almost a hundred thousand feet of elevation gain. That's a big deal. That's a lot of vert to crush in, in, in like four or five months ahead of the trek. So a lot of good numbers here. And, you know, the results paid off in the end. Okay, so getting in the trek, the fun part here. Uh, this was our itinerary, our 20-day itinerary. Seems like a lot because it was a lot. Anything with an asterisk next to it were things that we didn't actually have set in stone. Like, for example, Cirque, we weren't supposed to start there. We were supposed to start in Lukla. 
um, which kind of plays back into that, having that mental fortitude and international travel is all about going with the flow, <laughs> which we continue to learn throughout the trek almost daily. So the way this is kind of broken down is into segments. So either two or three days at a time, we'll just kind of talk about the general flow. We're certainly not going to get into all the stories and all the nitty gritty details because 20 days is a long time and it's, there's something happening all day, every day. So um, if you do have questions, just write them down or hold them till the end. So days one through two, uh, Sirke to Namche Bazaar. And, you know, we, we were getting some pretty poor weather for days from when we got to Kathmandu, really for the first like almost two weeks of our trek, we had not so good weather. Um, but the flip side of that was there were no flights going into Lukla, which if any of you know what Lukla is, it has the, the most dangerous airport in the world at 9,000 feet. It's, it's on a steep runway and planes come in and out of there, but when it's cloudy, they can't fly. Um, luckily, we got a helicopter and flew below the clouds, but they still couldn't get to Lukla, dropped us off at Sirke, which is about 2,000 feet lower than Lukla, which from the get-go meant we had some more elevation gain to do, um, which we were glad we had been training. Um, the flip side of that is there were very few people on the trail because of the weather. Um, really the only people that were out there were people that had got there by helicopter, which you know helicopter can only carry at most five people at a time. So it was pretty light on the trail and in the tea houses. Um, and unfortunately that first night, I must've picked something at in Kathmandu and I started to get pretty sick. Um, just started with like a little sneeze sinus stuff and that quickly progressed and <laughs> got worse and worse as we went on, but we still made the big climb um, over the Hillary Bridge and up to Namche Bazaar, which, and a lot of people will say is the crux of the whole trek. You're going from 8,000 feet up to 11,000 feet in one push. So it's a big day and you're getting up to high altitude really in just a day. So days three through six um, are kind of moving up from Namche and the trip really starts to slow down as you start getting up to altitude. Um, we kind of followed this method of climbing high and sleeping low. By climbing high, you're exposing your body to the environment of high altitude, which stimulates adaptation. And then you go back down to sleep at a higher oxygen environment even though it's still higher than where you slept last night. And that stimulates rapid acclimatization and really is the way to acclimatize in a healthy way. Um, but that day three was probably the hardest day collectively as a team we had. Uh, I woke up like, I'm not getting out of bed. There's no way I'm moving today. I should just go down. Like your mind starts going to some dark places. I'm like, it's day three. I'm at 11,000 feet. How am I ever going to get to 20,000 feet, let alone 12,000 feet? There's no way. Um, that same day too, my dad started getting some symptoms of AMS, which <laughs> was pretty tough. And we pushed our way up to Everest Bay or Everest View Hotel. Um, regardless of how we were feeling, Chanit slowly motivated us to stay hydrated, eat some food and make that push. Uh, my dad coined it the Everest Sometimes View Hotel because we didn't see Everest. We were socked in the clouds, um, <clears throat> but we kept pushing through it. And I'd, I'd love to create some space here for my dad to talk about his experience with altitude sickness. All right. You know, Mikey said we went up to uh, Namche Bazaar 11.2 from about 8,000 feet. It was a tough hike that day. Mikey was feeling bad. I, I felt great. It was a tough hike, really steep. You know, I know it's probably about 2,000 feet elevation gain and about two miles that last push from the Hillary suspension bridge to Namche, so it's steep. And we got to Namche, I felt great. We had dinner, Mike wasn't feeling great in the tea house, went to bed. I started waking up in the middle of the night with like a headache that felt like it was cutting off the top of my head, hot flashes and nausea. And I woke up in the morning and Mikey was a bit worse off than me. So I stumbled to Chani's room. Every night Chani would tell us, Sonam and I are in room 103, 105, whatever it was. If you need anything, come get me. So I came and got him. He brought his little medical kit with him, looked at me, and he said, you got altitude sickness, start taking your Diamox, which is acetylzolamide. It helps you acclimatize. It doesn't relieve AMS per se. It just helps you acclimatize. And I had, the preparation is really important. I had called, I'm a Kaiser member. I got an appointment with a Kaiser nurse, and we went through our whole itinerary. She prescribed the Diamox uh, for me and some other medications and shots, et cetera. 
that I needed to get. And Shawnee looked at me and said, take your Diamox now. Then he focused on Mikey. Said, you guys can have two hours sleep. We're getting up and going. All I want to do is go to sleep and actually just go home. <laughs> that was what I was thinking. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get evacuated out. I'm going home. This is it. Day three. We still got 17 days. There's no way. Shawnee came and knocked on our door two hours later, got us up, forced us to eat some Sherpa stew, which was really good but that morning it was terrible and we started he started we started trekking and it was the hardest trek ever i was having hot flashes a headache that wouldn't go away and spells of nausea i never I never threw up before i came close and again emotional i'm hiking it was it was really tough shawnee said if, if he from watching us the first two days the guy was very perceptive and very about who we were he said had you and Mikey not been so strong, we would have stayed one more night in Namche Bazaar if I wanted to push you. So we hiked up above 13,000 feet, back down to 11.2. I got the tea house and I was ready to check out. I, I was homesick, I wanted to go home. I'd had it and Chani said, go sleep for an hour. Got me up, said, take your Diamox, forced me to eat again. The next morning I got up and felt fine. So, you know, I think that truck helped going up higher and back down. And then I took Diamox until we returned to Namche Bazaar twice a day. And uh, if I was to go again that high, I'd just take Diamox from the beginning. It, side effects are tingly lips and tingly fingers, which I didn't get. The other side effect is it makes you pee a lot, like every hour and a half if I was lucky through the night. So that's the only thing that, that it has you do, but it, it helped me through the trip. And I don't think I could have done it without the Diamox. And Mikey's encouragement, even though he was sick, he was encouraging me, Chani and Sonam. They were they were with us the whole time and coined the, the phrase, never give up. So that's what we did. We never gave up and we kept going. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing that. This is really where this theme of perseverance started to settle in with our team. You know, it was like, hey, we feel terrible, but just one step at a time, you got to keep pushing. And by day six was when I really started around the corner. My day, my dad, it was like day four started to kind of feel a little better. And really this, these two days at Machermo, Machermo is like a village at 14.2 or so. And we did a day hike up to 15.5. And that was the day where I was like, okay, we're going to do this. We got this. We're feeling good. We're at 15,000 feet. We're acclimatizing. We're going to push through. So as we kept moving, weather kept coming in. Uh, we made it up to Gokio, which are these beautiful glacier lakes that are these this miraculous turquoise blue with huge mountains all around us. This is Chalatse here, a 20,000 foot like classic peak in the Himalayas. And we had a big acclimatization hike, which is really like a, a big climb up to Gokio Ri, uh, which is 17,500 feet. And that was a big challenge. We had an early start. And kind of as we were going in, the clouds were, <laughs> or as we were going up, the clouds started moving in. Eventually we got socked in and didn't get the views, but really didn't take away from the experience at all. It was still amazing. Um, and the following day, we had to traverse this glacier, which is a massive glacier coming off Cho Oyu, which is an 8,000 meter peak, one of the tallest mountains in the world. And that night at Gokio Lake, we woke up and there were six inches of snow on the ground. And as we were traversing this glacier, it was dumping snow. We were getting soaked and just like couldn't get wait to get to the next tea house to stay warm. And this was really kind of all getting us prepared for Chola Pass, which was kind of the, the literal and figurative hump of our trip. This was like the big crux of our trek. And we knew if we could make it over Chola, we were more or less home free. So Chola Pass goes up to 17,850 feet, which is pretty high um, and would be one of the highest points that we're trekking throughout the entire trip. Um, again, it kept snowing. It was really wet. It was cold. Uh, we weren't even really sure if we were going to be able to make it over because it had been snowing for so long and no one had gone over the pass in several days. So we got an alpine start, woke up super early, and we actually were the team to open the route. We were breaking trail through two feet of snow, almost all the way up to the Via Ferrata. It wasn't a true Via Ferrata. There's just some iron cables that you hang on to, like you can see in this photo up here. And after a huge eight hour day, making it up and over, we made it to Zongla, which is kind of the, the village on the other side of the pass. And we were officially in the main Kumbu Valley, which is where Everest Base Camp is. 
And it was somewhat of a relief to get through that day because we knew, okay, we've gone up to 17.8. It's higher than ever space camp. We're literally halfway through our trip time-wise. We're going to pull this off. We, our confidence level was rising as we were moving. And we did get a couple glimpses of some good peaks. We saw them at the Blom and, and some really amazing views of the mountains. So this was kind of only a two-day window, but a lot happened in this period um, once we got to La Boche, which is at 16,000 feet. And now we're at very high altitude and we're sleeping and staying at this altitude day in and day out. So from La Boche at 16,000 feet, we push up to Gorakshep, which is the next village and the highest village in the Kumbu region at 17,000 feet right here. Um, basically, there's a few tea houses and some helipads. <laughs> and a lot of trekkers trying to get to Everest Base Camp. So we go from Labuche to Gorak Shep, have a little lunch, and continue going up to Everest Base Camp, which, again, the weather deteriorated, started snowing on us at EBC. And truthfully, this was a conversation we talked about a lot, was really Everest Base Camp was a rock with some words painted on it. Um, we were there in the fall, so it wasn't climbing season. There wasn't any expeditions going on, so really it's a pretty arbitrary point. And we were reflecting on it like, wow, Chola Pass or Gokyo Ri physically was really a greater challenge than just going to Everest Base Camp. And we were really grateful that we had that time on the trek to experience those other things because, you know, trekking the EBC and back, while it will still be very amazing and the trip of a lifetime, we were really grateful to have those extra experiences as well. Hey, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing about the, on these treks, okay, sometimes we're on like a, a defined trail, like the one picture Mike showed earlier. The trail to Everest Base Camp is boulders. You're kind of it's it's a defined route over boulders and rocks, uneven surfaces, a couple steps up, a couple steps down. And remember, you're going over seventeen thousand feet, and it's tough to breathe for me, especially. Right? It was tough. Our uh, usually Sonoma would be in front. Johnny would be behind and Mike and I'd be somewhere in the middle. And there's times where Sonoma's taking steps, maybe one step every second or two seconds, setting the pace for us. And this is pretty much all the time we were climbing. And then we'd he'd stop there and we'd stop, make us take off our packs, make us sit down, drink some water. And then the word jam jam would come out, which in the Nepalese means let's go. So they took good care of us, but it's not just a trail. You're climbing over boulders, and you're moving out of the way for the yaks and the donkeys and the choke pays, which are part cows and part uh, yaks. But it's not just a straight hike and there's people coming in all directions. So that adds the difficulty of the trip. Yeah, very well said. Way to put that in perspective. And that, that's something I haven't mentioned is, is how much else there is going on. You know, not only are you looking at these views, but yeah, it's not a well-defined trail. Um, especially that last push from Laboche to EBC, it's very, it, you're walking on the Kumbu Glacier. It's a dry glacier, but there's ice and there's rocks and there was a rock fall event that missed us. And there's a lot going on up there. And yeah, the, you know, another saying they had is like inside safe side, outside suicide. And if animals are coming and you're on a steep ledge, you better get on that inside because the act doesn't care where you are. <laughs> it's going down. So yeah, a lot to consider. And that's good perspective there. Um, stay the night at Gorak Shep. It was, you know, relatively comfortable for a village at 17,000 feet, but you're also staying at a little tea house at 17,000 feet. The amenities slowly decrease the higher up you get. Uh, that next morning was an early start. Climbed up to Kalapatar at 18,500 feet. Got the amazing views of Everest. And if you're going to Gorak Shep and you're feeling up for it, go for Kalapatar. It's really amazing. Um, but it's a big day. You know, we went up to 18,500 feet and descended all the way down to 14,000 feet. And we were rewarded with uh, a little tea break and <laughs> got some first coffee in weeks at, at the Cafe 4410, which is amazing. You have something to add, Dad? Yeah, I I did not do the Calipatar hike. Uh, we were staying at Gorchup at 17,000 feet, and we were up like uh, our room in the tea house, which I can almost 
we can reach out our arms, almost touch both sides of the room, two beds in there, two duffel bags, two backpacks. And it was up like two little half flights of stairs. I was out of breath when up the first one. The weather wasn't great. We had a big hike that the day after um, Palapatar. And I, you know, I knew my limitations and I said, I'm not going. And I was fine with that decision. Chani was very happy because he had to stay, got to sleep in and stay. Because if I had gone, we would have left at four in the morning. Mikey and Sonam left at five or so. The other thing is um, elevation is tough. After about 15,000 feet, nightly, number of times a night, wake up gasping for breath. You wake up going, <laughs> gasping for breath. And I had done my research, knew it was going to happen. Shani said it's normal, still scares the hell out of me. So then I didn't want to go back to sleep. Even though I was tired from physically from not sleeping, the, the walking I was able to handle because of my previous training. That's really what saved the, the 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 trip for me. The breathing, those kinds of things, you just gotta get you don't get I never got used to it. And we spent I probably spent what nine days at over fifteen thousand feet and that That's never amazing. went away. It just scary scares the hell out of me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the reality of it on these tracks. Like all of these things are options. And if it's not in the cards, it's not in the cards. And at the end of the day, he was like, I'm really glad I didn't go up Calipatar. <clears throat> so moving along here, we had done EBC and now it was time to work over to Island Peak, which in this trip plan, you know, when I pitched this to my dad, I was like, I, I can't go to Nepal and not try to climb something. Even if it's like the smallest Himalayan peak, still a big deal. So this was kind of when the trip shifted and things really started to slow down. We had our first like relaxing morning at Dingboche and weather kept coming in, um, which actually forced us to take an extra rest day. And we were down to our final day to do Island Peak Climb with our itinerary. We were on day 15. We only had five days left. We had two days to do the climb and three days to get out basically. Um, so we were kind of at crunch time for making this happen, and the weather just had not been cooperative at all. Uh, a lot of Dalbot at this time, really trying to get the calories in ahead of the climb and, and get prepared for what's to come. So talking about the Island Peak climb, this was a really big experience for me. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I'm a mountain guide, a lot of time mountaineering in the Pacific Northwest, and this is a whole nother ball game. Himalayan mountaineering is not climbing a, a 14,000 foot peak in California. It's a, a totally different sport, if you will. Um, just, you know, from start to finish, it was just a whole different experience. Essentially a four mile walk to base camp and a whiteout. Um, got really lucky that night. The weather cleared. We had a perfect summit day, really. It couldn't have gone any better as far as weather. Crystal clear, super, super cold. Um, like walking uphill in all of my layers. And that's like base layer, shell, and second shell, down parka, long underwear, climbing pants, like heavy, heavy mittens. It was freaking cold. <laughs> and <clears throat> really, the climb itself started out with a little bit of a scree trail, turns into some scrambling on some rocks. There was some ice, uh, you know, and this is all by headlamp, still dark. Get to crampon point, put our crampons on, get on the glacier a little bit of glacier travel, and then you're at the crux of the climb, which is the fixed lines. The fixed lines, you use a tool called an ascender or Jumar, which essentially is a progress capture. You slide it up the line, it catches, you take a couple steps, sink your ax into the snow and kind of repeat this process. And at this point, we're over 19,000 feet and you're moving slow. Sun hadn't hit us quite yet. Some clouds are rolling in. It was a little windy, it was cold. And kind of ran into this situation where Sonam's crampon fell off his boot, which on a 70 degree slope at 19,500 feet is pretty much the last thing you want to happen. And this is where my experience really came in handy. Being in the middle of the rope team, I was able to hustle up and help uh, Sonam get his crampon back on his foot. And this is where this theme of teamwork really came out again of you know, if, if you decide you want to go on a Himalayan climbing trip or really any expedition at all, you need to be a valuable team member, uh, especially when when things start going off the rails. Uh, you want to have that experience. You want to be confident. You want to trust your team members because that's really all you have up there. But eventually made it to the summit and it was amazing. Definitely shed some tears. 
and definitely one of the most spectacular views I've ever seen. It was, it was a really incredible experience. Um, and it was a long day. It was 13 hours camp to camp and you know, over 3,500 vertical feet of climbing all above 17,000 feet. I had woke up with some GI issues, stomach gurgling. I had like the hiccups really bad all day. On the summit, I started to get a headache. And again, this was like, okay, I was sick before. I'm going to get through this. Um, and we made it all the way back down to Chikung. But by the time I got there, I was, I was pretty toast. I was one of the, like, probably the most tired I've ever been. And eventually made my way to the pit toilet and vomited, which was a terrible experience. Um, <clears throat> but the next day I woke up and I felt amazing. Um, we were home free. We had three days to go down and we were pretty psyched. Um, we had done everything we went there to do. We made it to Gokyo, went over Chola Pass, went to EBC, climbed Island Peak. And because we were a little bit delayed, we had three days to cover 33 miles, which we did. And there were definitely some long days. We were tired. We were depleted. Uh, you know, you, at, at that altitude, your body's tearing through calories. And <clears throat> we were tired, but we kept pushing and we made it. This is also when the weather just completely opened up for the rest of the trip and we got all the views we missed on the way up, which really kind of made up for it all. And it was perfect in that way. We had some poor weather, which added some adversity and made it exciting um, and no people. And the way down, we had all the views kind of going the opposite direction of all the people going up to EBC, which was a lot of people, uh, more than I would have expected. Probably some of that was due to weather jamming up some of the flights going into Lukla on the way in. And really, you know, it was bittersweet to end the trek. Uh, my dad stopped drinking more than a month before the trip. And, you know, to get that Sherpa beer on tap and Luke Love was like, hallelujah, we did it. But at the same time, it was like, man, we're like, we're leaving the Himalayas tomorrow. We're hopping on a plane. We're going back to the city. We're going back to regular life. And, you know, so these experiences are so valuable and it's really important to stay present and cherish them and, and take everything you can and those feelings that you experience up there take it home with you and share that with your loved ones and your friends and everyone you come across. So that kind of wraps up the trek and just a few things I want to highlight as far as trekking. These were our total numbers. So these were our average days. These are all of our days and times and I'm recording this too. And if you want a copy of it, I'm going to upload it on YouTube and I could send it to you directly too, if you want to look more in depth at this, but um, our average hiking time was, you know, almost five hours a day, just over five miles almost 2000 feet of climbing, which isn't really a lot, but doing that 20 consecutive days at high altitude is a lot. <laughs> and our total numbers, you know, almost a hundred hours of walking, 110 miles of, of, of travel, um, 36,000 feet of elevation gain and over 70,000 feet of total elevation change, which it's a lot of movement. And I was freaking sore at the end of the trip. My dad was tired. Like we got to Kathmandu and slept like babies for days. Um, and, you know, just a few other things to highlight. The, hot, the tea houses were amazing. And if you start reading stuff online that the tea houses aren't that great or they're noisy or they're loud or dirty, like, I don't know, we didn't experience any of that. It was amazing. The, the culture was there, hanging out with the little kids that live there, the yak dung fires, the food, the friendly Nepali people was so welcoming. It was amazing. Like I loved every tea house we stayed at and it was always a new experience. The doll bots always a little bit different. Um, and you know, it's just, you're in a new place and it, it's just amazing. So don't, don't be worried about the tea house situation. Definitely bring your own sleeping bag, your own pillow, that sort of thing goes a long way. But even that, like the bed sheets weren't that dirty. <laughs> they were pretty clean most of the time. And it was really never an issue. Um, the food. I couldn't do this presentation and not talk about Dalbot power for 24 hours. Uh, pretty much every day I was like Dalbot, <clears throat> unless I was sick, then I wasn't eating Dalbot. Um, but the Dalbot, the momos, the veg fried rice, the veg chow mein, uh, this is champa, which is like this porridge oatmeal substance that you know me, I love oatmeal. So I was really excited when I found champa and the food was outstanding. But above the tea house and above the food, really the most remarkable thing about Nepal is the culture, all, all the religion. And even if you're not religious, you're not Buddhist, you're not Hindu, it really doesn't matter. Matter Just the spiritual charge of this place is palpable. Go to the monkey temple, go to Bodhanath, 
go to the Hindu temples in Kathmandu. We went to several monasteries on the trek. Um, probably one of the most powerful components really of the whole trek is putting into perspective of the people that live here and their values and how they treat others and treat each other, how welcoming they are. If we could just channel a little bit of that here in the States, um, you know, probably go a long way. So um, <clears throat> if you do go there, try to embrace the culture and it's, it's really fantastic. And I'm, I'm really grateful we made the time to go to these places in Kathmandu and on the trek. Okay, so kind of our, our final key takeaways here, and then we'll get to Q&A. We're kind of running down to the end of our hour here, but as far, and these are training insights. These aren't like life insights necessarily. There's a lot to unpackage with all of this, but you know, the time training on our feet was huge. So all the hiking we did, all the miles we put in, the elevation gain and loss really was the difference maker. Like my dad has mentioned, and I've mentioned, and just feeling good day in and day out. And knowing in the back of your mind that no matter how sick you're feeling or how badly you want to go home that day, you're going to rally through it and, and you're going to make it to the next tea house and you're going to be okay. Uh, strength training was super effective. I came home, got on the scale. I had lost 13 pounds since I left, which was a lot. And I could feel it. I felt depleted. My dad lost about 11 pounds. And I really believe that putting on that muscle mass ahead of time enabled me to have greater endurance and, and have more reserve out there, um, decrease my risk of injury most likely and expedited my post-trip recovery. So rather than coming home and taking a month to like start to feel better, um, it really was a couple week period before I was hundred percent, but still I think that could have been much worse had I not put that time in strength training and also putting on that muscle mass ahead of time doesn't mean I was eating a bunch of garbage. Um, I was still trying to be healthy and intentionally ramping up my calories in a healthy and sustainable way to put on weight. And lastly, and hopefully you're all starting to hear this theme throughout the, the entire presentation here is strengthening your mind is key and being mentally prepared for what, what's going to come your way. And you can do all the research you want, but if you're not in the right mindset to handle the difficult challenges you're going to face, it's, it's going to be tough. And Really, there's no way around it. Like my dad mentioned, it's not an easy path to ever space camp. It's, it's hard. 17,000 feet is hard. <laughs> no matter who you are, unless you're born and raised at 17,000 feet, it's difficult. And, you know, that's something that you just have to embrace and know it's going to be difficult. And you're going there not to just tag this, this place, but um, for this life-changing experience, you come back a different person without a doubt. Um. So that kind of wraps up the takeaways, and I'm certainly happy to go over the the seven o'clock, you know, cut off. What if you need to bail out of here? That's fine. I'm going to record this whole thing. So, um, but yeah, I'd love to open the the floor for any questions or comments, insights um, to everyone, and, and thank you all for listening. Hi, this is uh, Vijay. Um, uh, Dennis, after uh, day two, um, you uh, started taking time off. I'm assuming you continue to take it, or did you stop it after? Yeah, once you start taking Diamox, you don't stop until you go back down to basically where you started from. For me, it was Namche Bazaar, and so I took it, even though it's come down. The nurse said you can stop the two days after you start descending. I think I went about three days after we started descending. Uh, and it was fine. You don't stop taking it because then you run the risk of getting sick again. Again, it doesn't prevent altitude sickness. It helps your body acclimatize by allowing your blood to take in more oxygen. Your blood, it, it, your, your body thinks you're, you need more oxygen, so it opens up your um, vessels to, to take in oxygen. So yeah, I kept taking it all the way through. And Johnny would ask me every morning and every evening, Dennis, did you take your Diamox? Dennis, did you take your Diamox? Because he knew I needed to keep taking it. And again, if I was to do this again, which Delene asked in the chat, would I do it again? Yes, in a heartbeat. If you were to ask me on day 21, I would have said, no way. But <laughs> like the further I get from it, the more I realize I'd love to do it again. Maybe not Everest region so much, but there's other regions in Nepal or other long treks I think I could still get in and I'd love to do that. And I guess one thing with, with the Diamox is just be prepared, prepared with it. 
The guys don't carry it. You can buy it in Kathmandu pretty easily for going there. But I got mine here on a prescription through Kaiser and I had it with me and I'm, I'm glad I did. Yeah, right. You, you said you skipped Kalapathar. Was, was it a, a, a optional uh, trail or how did that work out? Yeah, it's 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 a common trek that people do from Gorchuk after doing Everest Space Camp because you, if the weather's clear, which it wasn't, you can't see Everest from Everest Space Camp, but you can see Everest from Kalapatar. So a lot of people go to Kalapatar. It's a very steep hike in a short distance, and I knew that going up half flight of stairs if I was winded, I would not be able to do the hike. It would have probably been a 12 to 14 hour day of hiking for me, and I, you know, as Clint Eastwood once said, kind of paraphrasing, every good person knows their limitations, and I just do my limitations. And I thought, you know what, I'm not going to risk it and not enjoy it. I'll just soon uh, stay at the tea house. And I also, just to make clear, I did not do Island Peak. I'm not, I'm not a mountaineer. I didn't do it. I spent four days at the tea house. Thank you. This is Praveen. Uh Okay. Thanks for providing the information. And a quick question on the uh, anaerobic um, uh, training which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you guys do the that? Did you guys do that practice, or how does that work in California environment? I mean, do you can you give some inputs on that? Absolutely, yeah. So anaerobic just means without oxygen. So, <laughs> for example, uh, like anaerobic bacteria grows without oxygen. Um, and in the same way, our body can perform exercise without oxygen. And the primary fuel source then becomes sugar and stored forms of sugar like glycogen in the muscle and in your liver. But <clears throat> all that being said, really the key with training for something like this is having an aerobic base. Aerobic exercise is with oxygen. It's described as that slow, steady state movement lower heart rate zones. So if you have five different heart rate zones, zones one and two is slow, steady state aerobic exercise where that's where we're building mitochondria and really building that solid foundation. The anaerobic training really should only be 20 to 30 or so percent of your total cardiovascular training. So really, if you were to go outside right now and start sprinting up a hill, you would start in your aerobic and then be very quickly in your anaerobic state, which you could only sustain for a short while. So <clears throat> trekking, hiking five plus hours a day is mostly aerobic. What the anaerobic training does is it gives your body and your cardiovascular system the ability to take on a higher load. And I kind of think of it as like, as I improve my aerobic fitness, it's also improving my anaerobic fitness when I do need to push a little bit harder. And by pushing a little bit harder occasionally with my anaerobic, it increases my aerobic capacity as well. So anaerobic has nothing to do with altitude, except for the fact that when you're at altitude, you're more likely to tap in that anaerobic zone sooner, which is why you're going to burn more calories and blow through more sugar, which is really important to eat a lot of food um, <laughs> to stay well fueled out there. But <clears throat> yeah, so th does that help answer that question and clear the mud a little bit about the difference between aerobic and anaerobic? Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, um, but in specific, is there a, uh, some type of exercises or practices you did uh, before? Um... Definitely. So, you know, speaking to my dad's training, most of his anaerobic exercise came from a spin bike and doing interval training, like high intensity interval training is a great example of you're working aerobic and anaerobic systems. Um, a lot of my anaerobic training came from running uphill. And even I'm sure my dad hit anaerobic zones, hiking uphill, um, carrying a heavy backpack. Basically a good rule of thumb is if you're breathing through your nose, it's aerobic. If you start needing to breathe through your mouth and you're huffing and puffing, it's anaerobic. So there are certainly exercises like burpees, for example, is a great exercise of an anaerobic movement. A great example of an, of an anaerobic exercise. Also weightlifting is anaerobic um, because you know think of something that you can only sustain for a minute or two, that's anaerobic versus something you could sustain for hours and hours is aerobic.
Hey, Mikey. Yes. Jessica yes. asked in the chat if uh, the trip changed my life, the trek changed my life. And yeah, it did. It changed it, like Mikey said, before we even left. I was training for a goal. I've never done that before in my life. I've gone to the gym and worked out since my 20s, you know, for 40 some years at a gym until I got COVID hit and I started working out at home on my studio bike. But to train for a goal really put me in a different mindset for training. I, I get worried because my, my studio bike broke. I had to get a part and it took a while to get it. It got so hot I couldn't hike and I'd start panicking and call Mikey. Mikey, I'm going to miss a couple of days. So we're going to do a mic. We'd have to calm me down. So it did change me. Say, Dennis, if you miss Daddy, if you miss a day or two, it's okay. You're going to help you recover and you'll get back to it. So that helps. And I've changed my perspective on life, I think. You know, we realized how lucky we are here in the U.S. and how we live and all the things that we get and and are we're entitled to. And then you go see Camp Mandu, which is truly a third world country, and how the people live there and how much joy they have. I mean, our guide Sonam was practically dancing the whole time. He was he was just so happy and enjoying every moment of it. He still posts stuff on Facebook and uh, Instagram how much fun he's having. And so I think. That it also, I also learned that getting through the adversity, it really takes a team. If I was by myself, I would have turned around and gone home. Delene asked when I really thought about going home. You know, I, I didn't really think about it. It was more a result of feeling sick and being homesick. And I thought, I'm going to have to go home because I can't, I'm not going to make it. After that, I never thought about turning around. I knew I'd make it. I, I knew I'd make it, even though it was tough. So the adversity of working with the team and encouraging each other and being there for each other and supporting each other is huge. You know, I did 31 years as a police officer. We worked together and we covered each other. But in my in my personal life, I think I really took the lesson that adversity takes a team, not just by yourself. And you got to really be able to rely on others and lean on them and ask for help when you need it. Uh -huh. Uh, Mike, uh, this is Shanta. I have a question for you. So yes. did you go to the Iker's camp or the mountaineering camp? Why you didn't go to Kumbu Falls? Oh, okay. So yeah, we went to like lower Everest base camp. We didn't go to advanced base camp, if that's what you're asking. I think that's, that's the mountain. Yeah. yeah, that's more mountaineering. <clears throat> and, you know, there's, there's really nothing up there. Like my dad said, you can't see the views. Um, you're not going to hit like a new high point. You've already gone higher than that on your trek. And you're also exposing yourself to more objective hazard being on the glacier like that. So um, that really, I don't think anyone really went above. There were a few outfitters that do like an overnight tent stay at Everest Base Camp, but really never even didn't really show ha, appeal to us too much. So, um, okay. you know, most people doing the Everest Base Camp trek are going to that rock. <laughs> and, right, and, right. And hey Mikey uh, this is Manju here. I'm a friend of uh, Ujwal uh, he always speaks I of you uh, I had a couple of questions uh, the one regarding the porter um, the two porters like Soham and then uh, you said uh, Chino um, so how did you select them like you knew them before or you did some research or how did you pick them good question um, so we our guides arranged the porters. Um, essentially, Chanit was our lead guide and through his company got Sonam as an assistant guide and they had never worked together before. And Chanit and Sonam met and talked and Chanit's like, we need a good porter for this trip. And so Sonam one found Sonam two and Sonam two is our porter. So <clears throat> we didn't directly find a porter. If this being said though, if you get off a plane at Lukla and walk outside, there'll be 300 porters happy to take your bag at any time. So, you know, but then there's like this trust thing, not that anyone would steal your stuff, but knowing you have a good porter um, and just having someone that, you know, you can communicate with, which is where having a guide was really, really key to our success in those communication gaps. And really our trip went so, so smoothly because of that. So, you know, you could, through any outfitter, you could get a porter if you wanted to trek alone. If you were trekking with a guide, they're more or less going to make you get a porter because it makes such a difference in your performance and it helps the economy. So uh, you, you said you'll be um, 
uploading this to YouTube, will you be also providing a link for the the guide that you took? Like maybe they have a website um, yeah. where we can. Okay. So one last question I have is, um, I'm not I'm I'm not looking to do EBC next year. I more want to do Mount Kailash, um, which is like uh, Parikrama, probably you know. Uh, it's like a 50, uh, 36 miles, uh, the round that you take uh, with, do, with the mountain, the Mount Kailash mountain. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for uh, some guide. Uh, I don't know, generally people take guide and all for that. A lot of people do without the guide. But mm -hmm. I'm looking to see if I can get a porter or some guide company where I, I travel from here to Kathmandu or somewhere. And then I need someone just to be with me. And then I want to do this uh, to the park club. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you can if you can give me that link or the the website, I would probably call them and get some details. Definitely, yeah, I could definitely give you Chinese contact info and his trekking company, and and he's got all kinds of connections out there. He's been guiding for a while, and um, I would one hundred percent trust anybody he recommends. And I'm happy to talk to you directly too, and and um, you know come up with some sort of a solution there. But yeah, I would Thanks. you know if if you're on the fence about hiring a guide or a porter, I would recommend it. And I am a guide, you know, like, yeah. and I see the benefit in that too. When people hire, I all the time will get like fit, technically competent clients that show up on Mount Shasta. And I can't help but wonder, like, why would you hire a guide? And it's because you get the, lo the local knowledge. You don't need yeah. to stress about your trip plan. You show up, you have someone professional there to help you and you're in good hands. You know, that being said, it doesn't mean you should show up and, and not have any idea about what's going on. That's the expert halo. Um, you want to be prepared for, you know, do your own due diligence. That's where training comes in handy. Be of a, re a resource, be a team member. Don't just be a client. Yeah, totally. totally. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Lean yeah. asked about the cost of the trip with excluding flights, that flight to uh, Kathmandu and the flight from Kathmandu to Lukla or Circa, where we started our trip. It was five thousand dollars for me and Mikey, and that included all the permits. We didn't—I don't know how much the permits cost, but that's all included, which is wonderful because when you go to check in, there's checkpoints along the way to get to the national parks. Uh, Sonam too would go do the check-in. We keep going on, and he'd have to he'd wait in line, show all the all the information that he had, the permits, and then we keep going. That included all our meals. We didn't pay for any meals, and included. Uh, Johnny gave us a little lot of leeway. He bought us snacks, which weren't supposed to be included all the tea, everything. We didn't pay for anything on the trip, except for if you get the most tea houses, you got to buy a shower, which can be anywhere from 300 to 500, 700 rupees, which is what three to five, six bucks to pay for a hot shower. But all the meals, the guides, the porters, excluding tip was about $5,000 for both of us. Wow. Which, you know, is higher with the Island Peak climb too. You know, that, that added more as well. Okay. Additional permits and quarters and all that. Hey, Mikey, uh, uh, Lucas here. Um, What's up, Lucas? <laughs> hey man, how you doing? I just want to say nice job. Great organi organization of this. It's really cool to sit and um, watch this and listen to you. Uh, two questions for you. One is you mentioned wanting to put on muscle weight before going, and then you lost 13 pounds. I'm curious what you ended up putting on before you left um, above what you are normally at. And then the second question is for both you and your dad. I'm wondering if you guys could speak a little bit to uh, just how, how special or meaningful it was to do this trip together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first question, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm usually between 185 and 188. That's kind of like my sweet spot daily living, like not really training for anything specifically, but just staying fit and healthy. Um, before I left, I got up to 194. So I put on like six to eight pounds and that took almost six months. <laughs> so almost, you know, about a pound a month of a lot of weightlifting, intentional eating more. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm vegetarian. And so I really ramped up my plant-based proteins. I ramped up my carbohydrate intake. Um, I was diligent about taking a plant-based protein powder almost every day. And then, you know, the big thing was lifting weights and, <clears throat> but that didn't deter my cardio. And it, I actually was impressed with, it, it didn't, uh, you know, sometimes with like lifting weights and running or like kind of 
opposites end of the spectrum, you know, like it's hard to lift weights and gain weight and improve your running pace at the same time. But I actually found that it helped because I was running a lot uphill and building that strength endurance was, was great. Um, and I PR'd on a lot of different stuff, like climbing Mount McLaughlin, for example, I like set my record on that, which I've done a bunch of times and just felt like in general, my fitness was improving quite a bit, but, um, to answer your question directly, yeah, I gained like six to eight pounds, which took five to six months. And I, right now I'm home for three and a half weeks or so now, and I'm back to my baseline. And it took about two to three weeks to get back to my normal weight and feeling like, okay, I'm hundred percent. Like, but the first two weeks, it was, it, it was hard, man. I was tired. I was sore, you know, mobility was struggling <laughs> and I'm a pretty flexible guy. And I was like, wow, this hurts. <laughs> um, but yeah, your second question, man, that, that was the whole reason we did this trip, you know, like to have this experience with my dad was amazing. And every person I talked to ahead of this trip was like, that is so cool that you get to go do that with your dad, you know? And I've, a lot of close friends that have lost their fathers or just don't have that great of a relationship. And I'm super grateful to have that relationship with my dad where I could be like, we're going to freaking go to Nepal and go to Everest base camp. And, and really like to see him train for this and, and to put in all the work that he did and freaking do it is, is phenomenal. And yeah, I'm super proud of you, dad. <laughs> Thanks Mikey. And Lucas, from my perspective, you know, Mikey pitched this idea and he put together an eight page PowerPoint presentation for me that talked about potential itinerary risks, risk mitigation factors, a number <laughs> of things. And I wasn't sure. So I went to visit Mikey and we met with Eric Soul, the, his friend and mentor he mentioned before, and talked about Nepal. I was staying with Mikey, went back to Mikey's house, went to bed. I started looking at Everest uh, treks and seeing some of those suspension bridges and some of the things I thought there's no way I can do this. So it took me about a month to finally agree. And I thought about it and I talked to my wife because we're going to be gone for 30 days. Part one of those days was our anniversary. So it was going to be a long trip from home. And Lisa's first response was, why the F would you want to do that trip? And her next statement was the fact that Mikey asked you to go, how can you say no? And really that's what it came from, from a, Parents, from a father's perspective, a parent's perspective, the fact that Mikey even asked me to do this is incredible. We've done a lot of adventuring together, and this was the pinnacle of our adventuring. And, you know, that he wanted to be with me, wanted to do this with me, I had to go. And I'm sure glad I did. It, it, it's been, it was an amazing experience. I got to see Mikey in his element for 20 days and see how he handled it and his encouragement for me and saying, Dad, I'm proud of you. You're, you're killing it. Because I was getting, I get really down on myself. I'm really hard on myself. It's like, I'm going so slow. I'm holding this down. If people are passing this, I, every on the trails passes, Mike would say, dad, you're killing it. Just do the best you can take a step at a time. And that helped me get through it. Because I really get down on myself when I'm not leading the pack. Uh, Mikey, this is Vijay again. Uh, you mentioned uh, day one, day two, uh, both of you uh, were struggling because of altitude. Um, and do would you, if you uh, would change something, would you acclimatize one or two days before you start climbing or mm. what would you recommend? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And, you know, that's the, the crux of the whole climb or the whole trek, like I mentioned, is going from Fok Ding, which is kind of the village that most people start at, up to Namche. And it's pretty flat. And then there's this 3,000 foot climb up to 11,000 and there's nothing in between. So there's really no other way to acclimatize. The one thing that you could do that would help would be fly directly to Lukla and stay a night in Lukla. And that would at least give you one night at 9,000 feet. But you would, from there, you'd still need to go down to Fak Ding or Manju and stay a night at 85 or 88 before going up to 11. And John Neat said it usually, you know, but like 50% of the people are going to feel the altitude going up to Namche and more than just like shortness of breath, but have some form of altitude sickness. Because, you know, even if you are well acclimatized ahead of the trip, unless you have like a, a hyperbaric chamber, you're sleeping in your hypoxic tent every night, like you're 
you're going to get some sort of feeling not right being at high altitude. Um, there's just no way around it. And, you know, even then, like if we had spent, you know, a week in Utah ahead of time, we still had like five or six days of travel before it really wouldn't have made a difference. So, you know, the one thing you could do differently would be to stay an extra night in Lukla, um, which you could totally do, but usually you're so eager to get going. It's like, I don't want to stay in Lukla. Let's get on the trail. Uh, but that would be the one solution there, I think. Yeah. You know, a lot of the, a number of the guys will spend an extra night in Manche Bazaar to help acclimatize or even two nights to help you get used to it. It wouldn't help me because I got sick the first night there. And Sean, we took a little different route to have our space camp because we included Gokio Lake and uh, Chola Pass. Like Sean each said, you guys really did three treks in one because you did uh, Gokio Lake and Chola Pass, Everest Space Camp and Island Peak. But what his plan was to take us to Namche at 11.2, hike up to 13,000 plus to Everest View Hotel, and then back down to about 11.2 to give us like that second night at Nam Che. And I think if you're going to get altitude sickness, it's going to happen. And, you know, there's people that have done this hike many times, the first three times, don't get sick the fourth time they do. You never know when it's going to hit and who it's going to hit. And one thing I forgot to mention about the, the, the adventure with Mikey is, you know, I, Mikey, I, I'm so proud of him and what he's done with his oat training business. It's just been incredible. And actually to see him in action even while on this trek working, trying to connect with clients whenever we got uh, Wi-Fi, doing his blogs about the trip. I was really, I'm really proud of him and what he's accomplished really in a short time with this business. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, this is Shanta. I have a question for you. Uh, did you carry any portable oxygen uh, with you at the higher altitude? No, no, it's, you know, <laughs> Island Peak even though it's 20,000 feet is a relatively low altitude by Himalayan standards. And really it's not until you get above that 8,000 meter line where supplemental oxygen is really a necessary thing to have. Even if you're choosing not to use supplemental oxygen, most people at that altitude are going to have it just in case. Um, but 20,000 feet Island peak is like one of the easier climbs out there. One of the lowest elevation climbs out there, which is mind boggling, but and 8,000 meters is about 26,000 feet or so. And once you get above there is where supplemental oxygen is really key. Um, but, you know, at that altitude, it's not necessary if you're well acclimatized. You know, there are people that take helicopters from Lukla to Everest Base Camp. They're on oxygen the whole time because if they weren't, they would get super sick. But by the time I was at Island Peak, Peak Base Camp at 17,000 feet, we had been above 15,000 for almost two weeks been up to 18.5, like altitude wasn't an issue at that point. So what are the medicines uh, you carry other than uh, Dimax? What uh, other med medications? Yeah, meditation, medications. Um, pretty simple stuff. And, you know, that's part of the benefit of having a guide is Chani had a full med kit. Um, we had paracetamol, which was, is an anti-fever med, anti-headache, which my dad and I both tick. Uh, like I mentioned, I got pretty, pretty sick the first five or six days, had like a sinus thing that turned into a flu that turned into a fever. And I was, I was ill. Um, and he really helped with that. But outside of that, like cipromycin for GI issues, um, like ibuprofen, that sort of thing. I had a very small first aid kit because we had a guide. Oh, thank you. So Mikey, I had uh, one more question. So you, did, yeah. you didn't take the Diamox the whole trip, yeah? I did not. Nope. I was, yeah, I felt confident that, well, not so much that I felt confident, but I do have aspirations of potentially climbing higher peaks in the future. And my thought was like, well, I want to see how I feel at altitude just as is. And, you know, I'm actually pretty happy with how I acclimatized on this trip. Um, when I did Kilimanjaro, I got pretty sick on summit day, altitude sickness, pretty bad. Um, I still made it, but I was, I like, yeah, I wasn't doing so hot. Um, and this trip, because it was a slower, longer itinerary, um, I definitely had a couple days where, you know, slight headache or a little bit of nausea, um, but nothing that was like, you know, going to put me on the <laughs> sidelines for the rest of the trip. So, um, yeah, that was a personal decision I made. Um, and my dad decided to use it and we both accomplished the same goal. 
So, you know, it's totally optional and varies person to person. Um, you know, if you are like on the fence about it, kind of like what my dad did, he brought it and planned to take it if he got sick. And then when he did, he took it and he was fine. Good, good to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. We got time for, for probably a couple more questions here. Uh, so what, um, being a mom, so what was your backup plan? So if you guys declined and got worse, was there a plan to get you out of there? Mm. You know? Yeah. So that's another benefit of hiring a guide. We also had travel insurance, um, which was good for, you know, for me it was up to 6,000 meters. So in the event of an emergency, we have the Garmin inReach, like I mentioned, if there wasn't cell phone service to contact emergency rescue. Um, also, Chanit was on that with, you know, tea houses all have the ability to call a helicopter. Um, but essentially, if you get really sick, like real altitude sickness or um, some form of edema, whether it's cerebral or pulmonary, you're going down um, and you're going down quick. And depending on where you were in the trek, that's going to look different. You know, like if we were at Namche and we were really, really sick, we would have just hiked back down the trail. Um, the next step would be to hire a horse or a mule to take you down, which looks very uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, worst case scenario, getting a helicopter, which that depends on weather. Like there was a guy at Chikung at 15.5 that was pretty sick and the, the weather was socked in. So a heli couldn't come. So he took a mule down. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, and that's where, Again, going back to this whole thing of having a guide was really key in that decision making because if you were really sick and you were by yourself, mm -hmm. it would be pretty tough to arrange like, hey, I'm feeling really bad. I need to go down. Like you don't have that kind of energy to to get up and walk around and like, you know, coordinate a helicopter evacuation. It's it's tough. Mm -hmm. But that being said, all the tea houses are super helpful. Um, and I'm sure that they can make it work. But you know, horse helicopter going down if you get sick and and in nepal you can't even get your permits to go into the kumbu region without proof of travel insurance that covers medical evacuation then we can't get your permits so before we even left we had to send chani our verification of travel insurance so we could get the permits for us to go through the national parks that we need to go through to get to everest well that's pretty serious but you know, it isn't that expensive. It's based on the cost of your trip, basically. For and for me and Mike, it was like 250 bucks each for travel insurance for the trip. So it's not it's not exorbitantly expensive. That was up to five hundred thousand dollars for helicopter evacuation coverage. And the guides know the procedures, the questions to uh, answer. They're gonna need to answer when they get request helicopters. So you're you're really well covered. Yeah, the hell we you know the, the weather is bad at first, but uh, the helicopters are through that whole region like little mats. And when you look at them against these huge mountains, they do they look like little mats bzz, buzzing along the, the ridges, but they're everywhere up there. Just the weather shut down. We saw one guy coming down, we were trekking up to Chikum on horseback with oxygen. So he probably got really sick at Chikum because that's the that's the uh, staging area for Island Peak. So he couldn't even get helicopter out. But really, the only cure is if you get it, it doesn't go away, is to descend. That's immediately. Mikey, I have a quick question. Uh, so you said you went uh, late September, early October, right? Uh, is, uh, did you explore any other time frame for visiting? Like, I, I am actually sort of planning. Uh, in May time frame, is that a good time frame to visit? Yep. To yeah, safe? spring, spring and fall are kind of the two seasons that are are prime. We chose fall just because of when you know we kind of had the idea in like March, April. You know, we weren't going to go in May, so we chose fall. Just kind of worked with our schedule. You know, like guiding on Shasta, for example. I want to be there in the springtime. Um, <clears throat> there wasn't really a whole lot of rationale behind why we chose fall versus spring, um, but you know, both times, that's the time to go. You don't go in the, you could go in the middle of winter, probably be pretty cold and going to get snowed on. 
Um, <clears throat> but yeah, spring, you know, that April to May time frame is, is the other time to go. And it'll probably be a little bit busier that time of year. Um, that's also when like a lot of the big climbing expeditions are going on, but it's also going to be pretty fun to be out there during that time and, and see all of that firsthand. Mikey, can I ask? Um, you? What's up, man? Not much. Good, Good to see you. you. This is exciting. Um, question about static stretching. Mm. Um, I guess I'm just curious. Was that a daily thing? Um, what at what point in the workout would you do it, and what benefits were you looking for from it? Okay, so great question. Uh, primary goal of static stretching is to increase flexibility and, and, you know, muscle extensibility, the ability, the ability and improving a range of motion with all of that static stretching could be defined as holding a stretch for more than 60 seconds. And there's actually a lot of research out there that static stretching before exercise will decrease performance, decrease your ability to move, decrease your ability to contract those muscles quickly because you're extending them so long. So static stretching is best done after exercise. Uh, before exercise is more dynamic stretching and mobility techniques to get those joints lubricated, get the muscles warmed up, move them through ranges of motion. Um, and you know, static stretching could be anywhere between 60 seconds up to three or four or five minutes per stretch. Um, one of my favorite ways to do static stretching is yin yoga. Um, it's like a really passive yoga where you're just holding the pose and letting gravity do the work. And that's kind of what triggers the parasympathetic nervous system and the Golgi tendon organ to actually let those muscle fibers release. So if you are gonna stretch with a goal of increasing flexibility, do it for at least a minute each stretch, which doesn't sound like that long, but when you start holding a stretch and it hurts, like in your hamstrings, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of breathe and push through that, but it's not pushing through the stretch, it's just, letting it happen and over time, consistent work, which, you know, ideally you're static stretching every day. It doesn't always happen that way, but I have found that as far as like mobility and flexibility gains, like self myofascial release, foam rolling paired with static stretching is it works and it works really well, which for those of you that are in my program, know that we do a lot of foam rolling and a lot of static stretching <laughs> and dynamic stretching as well. Do you, yes, um, so you would do dynamic stretching typically before and when it was foam rolling always after, and would you do the static stretching after every workout or just specific types of workouts? Good question. So foam rolling really could be done just about at any time. Uh, you can foam roll like first thing when you wake up to kind of get the blood flowing because really what foam rolling does that pressure, yes, you're stimulating some relaxation, but more than anything, you're increasing blood flow and that blood flow is obviously good if you're going to work that muscle because it needs the blood, the oxygen, the nutrients, uh, but also bringing that blood, new blood helps carry away old blood. So scar tissue and other toxins that might be in there, that foam rolling can help move some of that blood around. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've even gone as far as like, if you're doing a set of squats, let's say, and your hip flexors are feeling tight, you could foam roll your hip flexors in between sets of squats, and you will probably feel the difference in your range of motion or your mobility on the next set. Uh, as far as static stretching and exactly when, you know, a lot of people will go like directly from their workout into stretching, which is great. You know, if that's like your hour time frame, and you're like, I only have this hour, I need to stretch now because the second I go home, it's not going to happen. That's fine. Um, I'm a big believer, like end of the day, kind of like as you're wrapping up the day, static stretching is great because again, it stimulates that parasympathetic nervous system can help with sleep. And you're not going to like contract those muscles again, you're going to go to sleep and have them stay relaxed. So, but at the end of the day, like if you were to work out from one to 2 PM and you static stretched at 2:30 PM, like it's better than not stretching at all. And even if you were to wake up and do your mobility sequence in the morning and then exercise in the afternoon, that'd be fine. Um, you know, just like if we were to talk about calories and gaining weight, it's not just a daily equation. 
it's a weekly equation or a monthly equation. Like you could zoom out on whatever scale you want. The mobility stuff, while the timing is key with certain things, it doesn't need to be so rigid. Um, except for static stretching immediately before exercise is not the best way. Does that, does that help? And, and yeah. as far as like what workouts, like we all got <laughs> muscle imbalances, you know, like if you go for a run, like your hamstrings are going to be tighter after you ran than before you ran, like stretch them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Mike. That helps a lot. Uh, I'm always challenged with the, the, the balance of the static and the dynamic and the, and the foam rolling and stuff. And, yeah, and it's so cool to see you out here doing this with your dad. Like, so oh, yeah. like it's inspiring. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming, Tom. It was great to see you, man. Um, Mikey, one more last question. Uh, yeah. What's your take on uh, balance exercises? Mm, love them. Do a lot of them. Uh, Bozu ball is an excellent tool. I know my dad had a Bozu ball. He was using a lot. <clears throat> Anything single leg is amazing. Pretty much if you add some level of instability to your exercise, you're doing something right. It really is going to force you to engage your core. Um, and just like my dad mentioned, like those sections of trail where it's really not much of a trail and it's bouldery, that's where the balance and having that proprioception is really key. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Bozu ball, stability ball, TRX, um, even like a foam pad, uh, barefoot on carpet, like all of these little nuances that we can change these small variables in our training can make a big difference in you know strengthening your foot the muscles around your ankle your lower leg and ultimately what we're really after with any sort of balance is it's forcing you to engage your core muscles so yeah a lot of balance training <laughs> cool. thank you mm -hmm. and um, maybe i lied you lied to you uh, that was not my last question but what's your take <laughs> on barefoot uh, uh, shoes Love barefoot shoes. Um, I'm a big fan of Zero Shoes, uh, the XERO brand. They're they're amazing, um, <clears throat> and that's something that I've recently uncovered in the last couple of years. Is kind of making this transition to Zero Drop, more minimalist barefoot shoes. I actually wore a pair of Zero Drop shoes on the trek, um, which was actually a, a kind of a big decision making point for me of like, what shoes am I going to wear? Um, and once I made that shift to Zero Drop. Um, I found that it's helped my mobility and just functionality, decreasing risk of injury. Um, but if you are going to switch to a barefoot or minimalist shoe, you need to do it over time. A rapid switch is almost guaranteed result in injury. Most often is Achilles tendonitis. So, you know, and with that too, that's where mobility comes into play. But um, <clears throat> I usually recommend people like slowly start to transition. So, you know, if you're training and let's say you should know what kind of shoe you're training in, if it has like an eight millimeter drop, you might want to switch to a five millimeter drop for a month and then go to a three millimeter drop and slowly work your way down. Cause if you do it all at once, just like if you were to start hiking every day and you haven't been hiking for months, you know, <laughs> you could, you could rationalize how that might result in injury. So yeah, huge fan of the barefoot shoe, but it has to be intentional um, over a slow, longer period of time. Thank you. But also I will say this too, like I wore a pair of ultras, which is like a, you know, popular zero drop running shoe with, with some cushion, but not a ton. My dad wore a pair of heavier duty Solomon boots, which for him, he wanted that extra stability. That's what he had been training in. That's what he's comfortable in. He wanted that support. Awesome. Like it, you know, so it really depends on the person, your objective, what you're doing, um, and what you're looking for in your shoe to help inform your footwear. Um, because I had been running in a zero drop shoe and I was going to be hiking for a month, I, I wanted the zero drop shoe for hiking. It made sense to me. Cool. Any other? Oh, Mikey, I'm on you again. I think. Don't, don't. Can you hear me? Yep. Maybe okay. not. So, sorry about that. So, the more and more you uh, give, there are a lot of questions. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Maybe maybe I have a weak, a weak uh, connection as I'm driving. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. But not now.
I think he went on mute. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, so sorry, can you hear me now? Gotcha. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. Um, so I was telling that the more and more you give information, I think there are a lot of more questions uh, questions to ask. So regarding that, uh, the the shoe, the zero shoe, or the so, but usually when you hike, you prefer a boots rather than a shoe, right? Is it like the comfortable? Is it the comfort thing? Because when I hike, generally I like to have an ankle support. So prefer the the preference is to have a boots, right? Then then uh, then the shoe, regular shoe. Yeah, so this is like a, a huge topic of debate, and this is like a whole nother, maybe I should do a whole nother hour conversation on foot health and shoes and footwear, um, but ankle support does not come from padding around your ankle. That's ankle protection. The support comes from the torsional rigidity of the shoe, so if you grab the toe and the heel and twist it in opposite directions, if it doesn't twist much, like, for, like take a mountaineering boot, for example, it doesn't move at all amazing ankle support if you take like a sandal or a flip-flop you can bend it in whatever way it has no ankle support supports coming from your your ankle and your muscles and your foot so you know the the upper padding around the ankle isn't really going to necessarily keep your ankle from rolling it might help a little bit but truly the support comes from the shank in the shoe that keeps it from rotating um that being said i wore an ultra lone peak hiker, which is a zero drop shoe that has that upper mesh because we're on rocks, you know, we walk through quite a bit of snow. Um, and I did want that extra protection, not necessarily stability. If you want strong, stable ankles, best way to do that is through training those specific systems through hiking on an even terrain, balance training, like I mentioned on Bozu balls or foam pads, that sort of thing goes a long way for strengthening the muscles that support your feet and ankles. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Does that Thank make you. Sense? Thanks for the details. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Mikey, <laughs> good to see you, by the way. What's up, Daisy? A pleasure to, to meet you as well. Um, congrats uh, to both of you on your recent expedition. Um, I, I agree with your last, uh, the last person. I. I feel like I, I first off just bought your bought the bozo. It arrived today, so I'm super excited to use it um, because I've tried to implement trail running over the last two years and was running with some Solomons. Uh, there were like trail running shoes, super lightweight, had some crazy traction, which made me feel really good. But I was I found that I was rolling my ankle, uh, particularly on descents, more often than I'd like. Um, whether it was a complete roll, which I've done twice, or a partial, which just slows you down nonetheless, it was still not good and hindered future weeks of climbing and, and or running or hiking. Um, so I think like your dad, I now have the mentality of like, I probably need a boot and strap it as tight as possible so that that doesn't happen. But um, I, I, obviously you can't run in a boot. So like you kind of, I think I need to build up that stability with the bozo and other exercises to really like strengthen an area so that that just doesn't happen in general. So I'm excited to start that journey right now. Awesome. Yeah, that's, you're right on the right track and really anything that's single-legged um, doing some like barefoot isometric exercises where like, you're just balancing on one leg um, that sort of thing. Plyometrics too is another big one any sort of hopping or jumping that requires you to move in different planes of motion in a controlled manner um, will translate to that movement on the trail. Um, yeah, a lot of the people I work with do a lot of plyometric stuff, whether it's with an agility ladder or like you mentioned, the Bozu ball, or even just like body weight jumping, stair hops, like that sort of stuff goes a long way um, and just creating that stability in the ankle. And that's where, you know, like, it's kind of this weird thing where like these big bulky shoes, they provide all that support, but we also have like dozens and dozens of muscles that are naturally there to help support our foot. So it's trying to find this balance of over time, you know, strengthening those muscles so you can feel better and more functional in a more free moving shoe. Yeah. I think for me, it also just came down to confidence. Like I didn't want to be on trail and then have that happen again. And I knew if I was wearing a bulky boot, yes, it was more weight up the mountain and down the mountain, vice versa. 
but there was like that was just one less thing I probably needed to worry about if I was going to roll an ankle or whatever I'm like all right you know that's solid you know worry about everything else definitely cool any other questions here we'll probably wrap this up soon <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Also, if you have other questions that come to mind, shoot me an email, um, <clears throat> book a free consultation. I'd be happy to like talk more in depth about any of these topics over Zoom. And um, yeah, I really, really appreciate everyone turning out for this. It was really cool. We'll definitely hold more events like this in the future on different topics. Um, and if there's something you want to learn more about in depth, drop me in line. I'd be happy to dive deep into some things. If we get enough people interested in this particular topic, chances are, if there's something you want to talk about, there's a few others out there that do. And yeah, I love hosting these sort of events and creates community and sharing information and stories. And yeah, I love it. So I guess we'll wrap it up here and I'll definitely share this on YouTube, send out an email if anyone wants to review anything on here. And yeah, thank you all for showing up.